All right, good evening and welcome to the October uh, meeting of the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club in 2022 here. I uh, just wanted to start off by seeing over on this side here if anybody is a visitor or hasn't been here in a real long time. Tell, stand up and uh, tell us who you are and uh, something about you. Thanks for coming. All right. Well, thank you for coming. And we've also got Bob Shoppy over here that'll be doing our program tonight, and he hasn't been here in quite a while, and a couple of years. And anybody over on the other side here? I, everybody looks fairly familiar. And they're still awake, yeah. <laughs> uh, what do you got, Brian? For the folks at home, Brian is showing us a model of a taxi. All right, Come well, on in, folks. We've got more empty chairs. Uh, I thought I'd do another little plug here, and I did write a president column for the November newsletter, so you'll see that coming out. But we are in that season where we're looking for more board members to join. We've probably got about two or three slots coming available here of people that want to step down and uh, take a break for a while. And so uh, if anybody out there is uh, interested in becoming a board member, pretty much the only requirement we have is just a monthly board meeting well you got to be a member and then we have a board monthly board meeting usually the first monday of the month unless there's a strange month where we need to meet a little bit earlier but it's just about a two-hour zoom call that we do starting at 6 30 p.m on this first monday of the month and usually goes for about an hour and a half to two hours so uh, if anybody's interested in that let me or dave know and uh, over to you dave yeah and that's that's important because we we do have some uh current board members that are uh, retiring off the board this year. So uh, those of us that are, that are here, we, we put in a lot of volunteer time, so uh, we, could, we could use a little help. So feel free to uh, get in touch with one of us if you uh, would consider that. And even we even have uh, one, one or two board members that live farther away, and they can at least join us by Zoom. So you don't necessarily have to live in the Denver metro area and always show up at these meetings. So keep that in mind because, you know, we... We don't want our club to fade away because we've all put in too many, too many years and one, one guy's doing all the work or five guys are doing and girls are doing all the work. All right. Uh, anything else, Andy? Uh, let's see. Chip. Chip always has some news for us. Come on up here. Good evening. Hey, anybody watching Amtrak number five tomorrow, look out for a couple of private cars on the rear of the Berlin and the Northern sky are supposedly coming across Colorado. Also the Colorado Pacific out there on the old Missouri Pacific towner line, they should be moving about 19 cars of cleaned out tank cars from NA Junction out toward Ordway, because guess what? They've got more trains coming to clean out some more tank cars. So the Missouri Pacific line is becoming a big storage location for cleaned out tank cars. Work's being done at the uh, new yard at N.A. Junction, which is east of Boone, Colorado. Anything else? That'll do it. Mm. You usually have a plethora of news. You know, anything else you can think of? Uh, so I guess I guess there was a big uh, photo charter uh, just this last week out in Oregon. Our uh, past president, Nathan, was there and he's still in shock. He's sitting down. He can't even stand up and talk about it. But I guess it was spectacular. So. It probably cost a few bucks, but hey, also for those of you that are watching from afar, I'm Dave Schaff, Vice President. This is Andy Dell. He's the president of the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club. And uh, if you're watching on YouTube, we, we want you to know that you could come to one of these meetings in Denver and you could actually join and become a member of the club and get, get our newsletter. And sometimes we have tours and, and trips and stuff, and you'd find out about that first. If you were a member, you know, we have a Facebook page, but we don't always have all that stuff on there because 
we do try to save a few a few good good goodies for the uh, for the actual members. Um, there's been, I guess, the rail strike has not been totally averted. I read in the newspaper today that the uh, maintenance of way and maybe I don't know signal people are not thinking they are going to vote for that. Have you heard anything about that, Chip? So, you know, so everybody thought that this rail strike was going away, but I know there's a lot of unhappy railroad workers out there. So stay tuned, I guess, is what you would say there. Um, about a month ago, some of you may or may not have heard that up in Cheyenne, the uh, steam team was uh, moving around the 5511 that's been in the roundhouse for about 50 years without hardly moving. And it's going to probably be leaving Cheyenne sometime in the next few months. So they were moving it around the yard just to kind of grease it up. They'd move it away and grease it again and move it away and grease it again. So that's, that's something. I know that a lot of the railroad magazines are probably talking about this big move that uh, a lot of these pieces of equipment will make to uh, Illinois. Um, I won't try to get too into that because I don't know all the details, but I know it's out there in the rail media. Also, before we get to our program, if everybody that's here and you folks at home will silence your cell phones, we don't want to have anybody interrupting our show and uh i guess this would be a good time to bring up bob shop oh he's silencing his cell phone he's busy at the moment but bob is the president of the denver south park and pacific historical society and that's another group that's looking for board members i think because bob didn't plan on being president for life but you know it's been at least 10 years right bob <laughs> will you give bob a mic yeah. is that on andy At least 10 years. Yeah, so Bob has agreed to come down and uh, do our program this month, and uh, I guess we'll, we'll let you ease into that. Go ahead, Bob. Thank you. Test, test. Is this on? Can you hear me? Uh, first slide. Oh, I'd do that. Well, thank you all for coming tonight, and those that are watching via Zoom or around the world on YouTube. Uh, it's been a couple of years since I've talked about Como, so uh, the original intent of this was a update of this year. It'll actually be an update of the last couple of years. Do I have control now? <laughs> well, while we're solving the technical issues, uh, good news is there hasn't been a, a railroad strike in Como for at least 80 some years. It's Happy Valley these days. <laughs> uh, we're always looking for volunteers. If anybody, and I'll talk about that at the end when I show you the websites. One more thing. That's in here. Okay. There it goes. It woke up. Como, the slow motion miracle. Uh, in a nutshell, it started being restored in uh, the 1980s by Bill Kazel and his son, Greg, Todd Hackett. I'm sure you know those names and some other guys. And I'll, I'll talk about that when we get to those slides. And they worked on that in the 1980s and brought it back. And then Como kind of went to sleep again until 2008 when the Como Hotel and Depot changed hands. And the prior owner had had it for about 30 years, wasn't interested in doing anything to the depot, which I'm sure you're all aware was very close to falling down. And it, it, I approached him in 2007 with an offer to stabilize the depot. We weren't even thinking about restoring it then. And he wasn't interested. And I thought, oh, heck, that's it. We've lost it. The first of many miracles in the slow motion process was the following February, it sold. And the new owners were very interested in saving it. So in 08, we stabilized the depot and then started applying for grants. And you know what the rest of it, but we'll show you that here in a minute. So the roundhouse restoration began in 1980. Uh, the next picture you'll see is Cameron, uh, Greg's son and Bill's grandson, who wasn't even alive when they started working on the depot. But there's the three of them earlier this year. And here's a before and after. 
of the Como Roundhouse. And the folks at home can't see this red laser, but they worked on the stonework. They rebuilt the doors, uh, an entirely new roof. About half of it had caved in, and there were cows and horses wandering in there. And all the windows were replaced. So here's what it looked like earlier this year. Well, Bill found a, a turntable bridge and put it in there, and it sat there for about 25 years. He didn't get around to do anything with that. And the depot was done in the summer, August of uh, 2015. And we had a big celebration and dedication. Of course, the going joke was, when's the train coming? And I was thinking, yeah, right, sure. Even I didn't think that two years later, just two years later, we'd have an operating steam locomotive, which necessitated to put the heat on the turntable. And that got restored and was finished the night before the locomotive's debut on Boreas Pass Railroad Day in 2017. So the Como Depot took seven years and about $420,000, but I think you'll agree it was worth it. The front of the building had sank a good two feet into the ground. Uh, originally, the foundation was tree trunks that had long since disappeared. So the joist uh, settled into the dirt and pretty much rotted away. And uh, when they restored it, the, the trick was, the first thing was jacking this up without it falling in on your head. Mike Perschbacher and crew did that. And they replaced some of the joists, sistered some of the other ones and then ran a, a header along the bottom of it and went back and forth with bottle jacks to jack it up to level. So the foundation work was the furry first thing. And then in the next couple of years, they redid the roof and chimneys. And just, it took a long time. I won't bore you with a hundred slides, but that's the, the beginning and the end of the project. So this would have been August of 2015. Como Hotel Restoration, at the moment, it's kind of in hibernation, but uh, we're working on a deal to change ownership of the hotel and bring it back. Here's something Todd Hackett put together a few years ago, uh, kind of a then and now. The black and white historic image was taken in the summer of 1897. The hotel was brand new, probably wasn't even open when that photo was taken. Uh, before that, in November of 1896, the Pacific Hotel that was on the exact same site burned down. So they built this in the summer of 97. And that's the building that's still there today. We have tried many methods to get rid of the white paint and bring the brickwork back. And the brick is very soft and the paint is very hard. And everything we've tried, liquids, uh, blasting with various materials, the brick disappears and the paint stays there. So one of the long-term projects may be to literally paint every brick by hand. I, I don't know. It would really look cool if we did that. But at the moment, I think the white paint is holding the building up. Our sister organization, the South Park Rail Society, they were created in 2017. And in a nutshell, why is this not advancing? The laser works. There it goes. So it's kind of a joint operating agreement, if you will, between the, the two organizations. And in a nutshell, the South Park Rail Society is in charge of the locomotive and the roundhouse, and the Denver South Park and Pacific Historical Society is in charge of the depot and laying track. This is the key to our success more than any other thing of the volunteers. And Tom Lawson is there on the left. He's a volunteer coordinator. Oops. Couldn't find the button. That's him right there. And we have a, a cadre of about 100 volunteers. And on, on a, any given day in the summertime, we'll have 25 to 35, sometimes even 40 volunteers laying track and doing various things. And the end of track is getting far enough away now that we need a ride to get there. This is the Gunnison, Maine, south of the Roundhouse, looking north. And today it, it goes a little farther behind where the photographer was standing. But we're up against a property line. In fact, we had to alter the exact course of this thing a little bit because it goes through telephone poles and then it crosses the highway, the county road, the Boreas Pass Road, which we will not do. 
So it does go further than this though. And at the other end of the track, here's the north end. Getting far enough where the uh, hotel is actually starting to look small. So this would be the Leadville main. And same spot, turning around, looking to the north. The track goes right through those aspen trees, but there's a fence line right here. That's the property line. And the next thing to do will be to put a switch right in here, and we'll have a parallel track. And there were actually four of them here in the Como Yard, in the north end of the Como Yard. I don't know if we'll ever get to all four, but the second one for sure. Um, this ranch house up here is a very large ranch. It's for sale. If anybody has a spare two, two and a half million, I'm not sure exactly what he's asking. And he likes what we're doing, but he won't let us build on his property because he just doesn't want to. It might be a factor with the new buyer that they might not like that. So we're hoping it sells soon and we'll renegotiate with the new owner. If we get permission to build, this would give us nearly another half a mile. It goes up through these trees and then turns left about a 90 degree left and goes over to the county road. And unfortunately, it crosses it if it stayed on this side that ranch goes up a long way. There, there's a lot of property involved with this. But anyway, that would give us another nearly half a mile of track. Grants, donations, and volunteers, the, the three basic things of what's going on in Como. Some of our support organizations, you may have heard of these guys, Rocky Mountain Railroad Club. I've heard they're nice folks. I don't know much about them. Okay, this picture was taken earlier this year, and it leads into what's going on with a locomotive. You can see the right side cylinder head is missing because July of 22nd, yeah, this is an ugly picture, but it's, it's an important part of the story. July 22nd of last year, we fired the locomotive up for, uh, for the first time in two years. We didn't do it the year before because of COVID. And it didn't go very far when the wedge it goes through the crosshead and the piston rod. It broke in half, the bottom half fell out. And when the steam got ported to the back side of the piston, it went forward like it was shot out of a cannon and pulverized the cylinder head. So that was the proverbial bad day of Black Rock. But little did we know, little did we know, this was a huge blessing in disguise. We found someone who likes to keep a low profile, so I won't mention his name, but you probably all know who he is. He came to our rescue, and here he is turning a new cylinder head. And here's the new cylinder head. We had it within 10 days of that failure. It looks like steel, but it's actually cast iron. So he brought it to us, and we thought, wow, we can still make Boreas Pass Railroad Day last year, until he looked down in the cylinder and saw that there was a cracked piston. So we talk about emotions going up and down. So then he starts walking around the locomotive and he says, Bob, do you have a legal pad? And I said, yeah. And an hour later, we had three pages of notes of all kinds of things that his trained eye found that we didn't even, we were not aware of. And this was the ultimate case of we didn't know what we didn't know. And it got more interesting from there. Uh, this is not the guy. This is, I forget his name, tell you the truth, but it's a friend of his who goes around the country boring cylinders. We mic the cylinders and found that they were a very nice oval shape. And the pistons were still round, so that wasn't going to work. So we bored them out till they're round again. And uh, this means, of course, we need new pistons and new rings, which he is going to make for us. The significance of this shot is the date, February 19th, 2022. Last winter, they worked almost every Saturday. You can tell by everybody wearing coats that this is not July or August. It was really gets cold in the roundhouse. You can imagine what Como is like in the wintertime. And they're going to do the same thing this winter, but now we're putting it back together. But one of the other interesting things was when he went down in the steam dome, we pulled the throttle body out, and he discovered at a glance, he could tell that the boiler had sat for years filled with water. And I'm sure you're all aware that's a big steam engine no-no. So there's a lot of corrosion in there. And it got more interesting. He got down to the tubes and looked forward and saw a really ugly patch job on the front tube sheet that was just unsafe. Um, there's a lot going on with this locomotive. It was tired and worn out. 
but he has adopted us. He's there almost every Saturday and he's going to be working through the winter and we'll have it back together and running this coming summer. Uh, it's sitting in stall three on the restored pit, which comes in really handy when you got to get underneath the engine. Here's the new tube sheet and the new tubes, 136 tubes. So, a slight tune-up. But we're on the road to recovery. How'd that happen? Somehow the picture got distorted, but there's the new front tube sheet, not yet welded in place, but just sitting in there. Nathan, where did we go wrong on this? Okay. Well, if you tilt your head sideways, it, it makes a little bit of sense. Anyway, we built scaffolding uh, to get up and into the dome a lot easier. If you've ever climbed up on top of a locomotive, that's a scary situation. And if you're going to do it a lot, now we've got scaffolding and it's a lot safer. Here are the tender trucks. They needed a lot of work as well. Um, there's a lot of wood in these trucks. These are arch bar trucks. And the wood was very, very rotten. So we're replacing all that, cleaning up all the parts. In fact, here's the new wood pieces. In fact, let me go back to this other one for a second. There's the two, uh, what are the castings that go on top of the truck that connect it? Is it at the bolster that connects it to the body? Um, one of them was broken completely. So the tender truck was just sitting under the body of the tank. And we're getting a new bolster for that. Here's those metal pieces and wood pieces again. There's a four inch piece in the middle and two three inch wood pieces on the outside of these. And they go across the trucks. Uh, the Sumter Valley 20 ton Plymouth that hasn't been there in a while. This is going to be our yard goat someday. It was originally built with a six cylinder Climax engine. It looks like three cylinders, but those are actually banks of two. But when we got it, the engine was missing a lot of parts, and we know that historically they were famous for breaking crankshafts, so we decided not to even mess with that and put in a new engine. And we were going to put in a 671 Jimmy Diesel. It turns out it was <laughs> a few inches too long. We didn't measure it close enough, I guess. But now we're putting in a 471. And the guys that are doing it down in Commerce City or out in Commerce City uh, are the Disher brothers, John and Steve Disher. This is their rig here, and you guys are probably familiar with their names. They, they move everything in Colorado, all the narrow gauge operations like ours, as well as BNSF and UP. I call this our garden of stone. Uh, these were all donated. These came off the, uh, the old CNS main line down in Denver. Uh, Nick Ralston is a BNSF section foreman, and he's been a great friend to us. I'll show you a picture of him in a minute. He donated these. And this is just the, the roundhouse floor. Someday we hope to put the original wooden floor back in. That's a big job. But in the meantime, I mean, it was just dirt and coal dust and cinders and whatnot. But at least with a stone, it it's, looks a lot cleaner. And you don't raise clouds of dust every time you walk across it. Uh, this is the old ash pit on the south end of the yard. The coal dock used to be right here. Uh, this was last, I think it was January. Steve, do you remember the date on this? Uh, it was November, thank you. Um, this is down in Longmont. Nick Ralston, ironically, is the only guy whose face you can't see because of the shadow. He's a BNSF section foreman. They were redoing a siding down there. You can see the new concrete ties. But this was one of our many, and, and there will be more, tie harvesting parties, we call it. So here we are. They would pull all the ties up. We would despike them, get the tie plates off them, and then band them five across, three high, and ended up with 300 on a tractor trailer. This is Disher again hauling these for us back to Como. And here we are unloading ties in Como. And the next step would be some of them we leave full length for switches and whatnot, but uh, basically we cut them all down to narrow gauge size. And here's the sign we were talking about earlier. There's two of them now, one eastbound, one westbound. 
point of interest, railroad roundhouse, this would be the, well, technically 285 runs north and south. So this would be southbound. Right there is the Como entrance. And there's another one of these just down the road here. Uh, let's call this an informal follow-up or, or update. The, the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club has been very generous helping us out with $1,000 grant uh, several years now. And the latest one that you gave us was for switch parts. And one of our uh, volunteers, Bob McDowell, he fabricates these head chairs, as well as some of these bars that go to the switch stand. And the actual uh, spacer bars we buy commercially. There's a close up of it. Probably not exactly original CNS spec, but they work nice. Uh, earlier this year, we finished the switch between tracks 10 and 11. 10 is a turntable lead. And we now have three operating switches. For years, we only had the one in front of the depot. And we'll have more next summer. And there's a close up of the commercially available spacer bars. We love these because they're adjustable. The original ones, I don't know if they were cast or cut out with a torch or whatever, but it only takes a certain size. And unless your rail happens to match that exactly, it either won't fit in or it'd be too loose, unless you were lucky and it was exactly the right size. And we have different weights of rail. So if you go with the adjustable ones, you can't go wrong. Different angle, the same thing. And some guardrails and spacer bars. Doggone it. This is a funny slide. If you tilt your head and look at it, I'm sorry, it, it, for some reason we transferred it to the, your computer. Some of the pictures went 90 degrees on me. Uh, but you can see, he's, he's looking at this thinking, wait a minute, actually this was a joke. We didn't really do this. Um, but the rails kind of, at the end of the work day, lent themselves to this. So we just pushed them over and uh, couldn't help resist taking a picture with him. We're going, wait a minute, what's going on here? And what this is all about, um, this year we didn't lay a whole lot of new track because we did a major realignment. It took most of the summer. In 2015, when we laid this track in front of the depot and that switch, which was operating from the beginning, we never dreamed that just two years later, we're going to start rebuilding all the Como yard because we have a locomotive now. And we used, I think it was a number eight uh, frog and we needed a number five, I think it was. I might have that backwards, but we needed a different frog to continue laying track where it's supposed to be. So we basically dug up all of this and further back behind the photographer and realigned it. And it's all done now. And the we, the third switch that we've built will be for track five where boxcar 8027 is behind the roundhouse. That'll be the first thing we do next year probably is make that a live track, but the switch is in place and it works. Uh, our second roundhouse stove is working. Boxcar 8311, you guys probably know the story on this. It, it's an interesting history, original CNS boxcar. And like a lot of CNS equipment, it ended up on the White Pass in Yukon. And over the years, it turned into a flat car along with its sister car, 8323, which you'll see in a minute. And when it came back down to Colorado, the Forest Service owns both of those cars. 8323 is over in the railroad park in Breckenridge. And they took 8311 up to the top of Boreas Pass across from the section house. And I think it was 2002 that they did that. And it sat up there for nearly 20 years. And you can see what Mother Nature and those north winds did to it. And the Forest Service approached us and asked us if we would help them refinish it. And I asked them, do you mind if we bring it down to Como where it would be a lot easier to work on it? And they're going to let us have it for a couple of years after it's done. It's supposed to go back in August of 2025 now. Uh, but we'll finish lettering it in the spring. And what's interesting is it was trucked up to the top of Boreas Pass from Breckenridge. So that would be technically eastbound on the schedule in 02. And then in 2020, it finally completed the pass, the trip over Boreas Pass. The first CNS car to do that in 80 some years. 
So we sanded it down. There's the first coat or the primer coat going on. And here's what it looks like today. Uh, we'll finish painting the metal and the second coat of red and lettering it in the spring. Uh, Jefferson Depot recently changed hands ownership and they told us they were going to bring in a standard gauge old Burlington Northern caboose and would we help them with a the track. So we sent some guys down there, a crew down there and laid this track with just this one short piece of a third rail here to show what narrow gauge looked like. It's on the original grade and then they brought in this caboose. It was sitting in the Denver yards for many years. And this was a Steve Disher thing. When they're told to move equipment, the contract is it goes from here to there. Oftentimes it's just scrap. And if they substitute something just for weight, the railroad doesn't care. For instance, the 471 that's going in our Sumter Valley 20 ton Plymouth came out of a, a work car, a standard gauge work car. And I guess it lived its useful life, but the engine had just been rebuilt. So they just, substituted other scrap iron for the weight and we've got a nice engine that's going into our our plymouth diesel and it has since been painted white or partially anyway what they're planning to do with this is make an airbnb out of it and rent it out they'll plumb it and electrify it so it is standard gauge but there is a burlington connection you're probably all familiar with the burlington owned the, the cns tom helped me out was it 1906 that they sold that or was it 08, six or eight, 1906 or eight? So there is a, a connection. Oh. <laughs> Colorado and Northwestern remnant, and I'm, I'm being generous here. This thing was sitting next to our CNS standard gauge box car in the coma yard, which is just our, our tool car. Uh, it's been there for a few years. And it is reportedly the only remaining remnant of a CNNW car. And uh, Keith and Vivian Pershing offered to adopt this thing, and they're going to work on it. I don't know if they're planning to restore it or what. That would be quite a project. But underneath this mess somewhere is supposedly the only remnant of a CNNW car. But right now, it's not in the Como yard. It's a little further, it's across from the post office, if you know what, what Como looks like. CNS gone 4319. This is the last known narrow gauge CNS gondola in existence. And in 1941, when the rails were pulled up and operation stopped in the old Central uh, Railroad, Colorado Central Railroad, uh, this and uh, the combination car 20 and engine 71 were donated to Central City. Today, engine 71 and the combination car is sitting on a pedestal, a very large pedestal outside one of the casinos up there. And this ended up, I, they actually steamed those, the engine and, and gave rides with those two cars in the 1970s. And then it ended up in a park about two miles outside of Central City. And nothing was done to it for the 40 some years it was sitting there. So we made him an offer uh, and we have a lease on it for 10 years and we told him we'd restore it. And that was part of the deal. Here's Charles Smith and uh, Tom Gillen and uh, Norm Acker working on it. And today it looks good again and it's fully operational. The brakes work, everything. It lost some metal too while it was sitting up there. And right in the middle here, if you look close, you'll see these are smooth boards and these are the original rough boards, except for the top one. We had to replace the whole top one. But this had been cut out as a gate for passengers to walk in it. It opened and closed. And that feature is gone. Um, this was a picture taken a few years ago, but the reason I put this one in here is that's Dr. Charles or Chuck Brannigan and his wife, Kathy. They owned the roundhouse and the locomotive. They also founded the Denver Brass. They were both tuba players. How many husband and wives do you know that are both tuba players? The two biggest challenges, of course, financing. Every organization like ours trying to do things, you're always looking for grants, donations to get things done. But the biggest one is actually this one. 
personality conflicts, egos, to be honest, and it's a little embarrassing to show this, I guess, but it's the truth. And keeping everybody moving in the same direction is a challenge. It's a challenge we love. It's a challenge we're successful at, but every now and then there's issues. Uh, this is a ni January 1929 photograph of the scale house. It was taken from the second floor of the Como Hotel. This is the Denver, Maine here and the Leadville, Maine. And you can see there was a, a scale pit there. And we now have a replica of this. And it was built by Craig Vanderborg and his father, Nicholas. Uh, we're not recreating the scale, but the house. And today we have our little scale house on the prairie. You probably think these are logs. Nah, these are water tank parts before a slight modification. And here's the modification process. One of our volunteers, Dan Silbaugh, his day job, he's a triple seven pilot for FedEx, but he loves to mill wood. And he's got this wood miser mill that's helped us tremendously. Here he's making the 12 by 12 uh, vertical supports for the water tank that we're recreating. Here's a pile of them ready to go. And uh, July of last year, right after the locomotive blew the cylinder head, uh, it was an up day. And the two main contractors are two local contractors, Chris Tome, Bob Revis, here's Dan Silbo again, and, and some guy with a, a spout piece. So here they are constructing the thing. And then we started painting it. And this is the original spout that will go on this tank. So there's the base today. And they have just started milling the next step, which will be the floorboards. And the staves on the side and the roof will all be pretty much three by six pieces of wood. Uh, this picture was taken several years ago. Uh, Dennis Topin in Illinois um, donated a couple water tanks for us. There's going to be four of these inside the tank. It'll be basically a dry tank. It's a 47,000 gallon replica is what we're building. But we don't need 47,000 gallons. And I'm sure you're all aware these things leaked like crazy. Even the railroad couldn't keep them dry. And in the winter, they look like popsicles. So we're going to have four of these 2,100 gallon plastic tanks up inside it for 8,400 gallon capacity. Um, that's more than enough for what we need. And we're also going to have uh, a riser coming down one of the vertical supports for the fire department. It'll have a two and a half inch quick disconnect that they'll give us. So they'll have access to this water should they need it. Uh, the service pits, this is, was, stall number seven and stall number eight we're restoring those back in the day i think every pit had a, a every stall had a pit but we're not going to evacuate all of them or restore all of them we've got the one in uh, stall number three we have an unrestored one in stall number six where we keep our speeder and our hand car and our tool car so we can get under them if we need to in there and here it is ready for rail Uh, this one just showed, we just put the posts in to latch the doors onto, which was original. And it was a big help because opening these doors on a windy day was a trick and the wind could catch it and somebody could get knocked off their feet and get hurt. So now we can securely latch them to these, these eye bolts. All right. Building the new roundhouse entrance. For years, this was just plywood. Um, originally, this was all stonework, like the rest of the back of the roundhouse, and then they added a, a square stone room for the boiler. The boiler ran a steam engine, which ran the belts and pulleys that operated all the mach machines, the lays and drill presses and whatnot. But we decided to make it our new entrance. So that's what it looks like now. Uh, it's more inviting than that little door on the side of the roundhouse. 
and we cleaned up. There was a lot of stuff laying here, but now there's brochures and a donation box and a map and a description of the roundhouse. Much cleaner look. And we don't normally would, would show or be proud of a bathroom picture, but I don't have a before picture. I wish I did. It would justify this picture. It was a cave before. So I painted the floor, painted the walls, all new furniture and a toilet. And uh, it's very inviting now and very civilized compared to what it was before. Uh, State of the Union on the track work. These are rough numbers of what we've done so far. And this was actually true last year. We haven't added very much track at all this year because of that major realignment that we did. But as you can see, that's a lot of track, a lot of work. And you can't help but ask yourself, gee, is it worth it? Well, what do you think? I don't know. Community support, um, we certainly have that in Como. And again, there aren't that many people to complain anyway. The, the winter population is 12 to 15 and the summer population, it swells to a huge 45 or so. But I think they all like it. Uh, boxcar 8179, this is another January of 1929 photograph. And you don't often, if you're restoring a boxcar, find a historic picture of it, but we do. This is boxcar 8179 today. This is one of the batch of the Victor Miller cars that went to the RGS after the CNS shut down their, their narrow gauge operations. And after the RGS shut down, many of the cars, normal progression, they end up in backyards as storage sheds or chicken coops. And this one we retrieved from just north of Montrose. And we haven't gotten very far with this yet, but we are gonna restore it. So there's 8311 again. I don't know why these are in here twice. But here's the one in Breckenridge, 8311, before they moved it up to Boreas Pass and its sister car, 8323. When the Forest Service first got these cars back from Alaska, uh, they were, again, flat cars. And uh, Marlin Ulrich out in Strasburg built the boxes on these. And even though this got really, really beat up up on top of Boreas Pass, if you look underneath the body, it looked like it was made a month ago. The wood is still you know, a light tan, it looks, it looks new inside as well. It just needs new paint, new lettering. October 1st of this year was our last volunteer workday officially scheduled. Several of us show up now and then, and the engine crew will be working all through the winter, but the last great hurrah ended in an appropriate manner. Another good year. Uh, this number, 325, it, it varies, what, Steve, probably weekly, certainly monthly. But this is an approximation of how many members we have today. So we got a lot going for us, a lot of volunteers helping us out. We spread the good word at little events like this one. Sometimes at bigger events. As you can see, there are a lot more South Park fans than you were aware of. And the usual suspects for advertising. Uh, this is our quarterly magazine. We've been doing it for 23 years now. And SPRS has their own quarterly magazine now called the Como Headlight, which was named after an actual Como newspaper in the 1880s. It only published for about three years. And if you find a copy, hang on to it. They are worth money. There are very few surviving copies of the original Como headlight. So some things for the future. Uh, Boxcar 608, we've been working on this for a long time. It's not quite finished. That's why it's in future attractions. But this is what we started with. Um, this car in the 1890s, I think it was, went to the Denver Boulder and Western and ran up to Ward and Empire and Nederland and those places. And when they were done with it, it sat on the ground and it ended up in somebody's backyard in the little hamlet of Cardinal, which is just outside of uh, Nederland. And it's probably been, God, we've had it for a while now, 12 years at least. Uh, the property sold 
uh, Jason Mediet was involved in this and the new owner wanted it gone. I think Jason was responsible for taking it down to their museum at that time in Boulder, which isn't there anymore, but it was all standard gauge. And he thought this thing needs to be in Como. So we ended up with it. They even found period trucks for it. They're not the original trucks, but they're, they're period correct. So this is what we started with. And that's what it looks like today. You can see, and Mike Perschbacher, who did the depot, did this. He looked at every single piece of wood and saved what he could. So the new pieces were rotted away as it sat on the ground. And we decided to restore one end and one side. And we're almost there. We just have to finish lettering it. This was built in 1879 by the Litchfield Card Machinery Works in Litchfield, Illinois. And here's a picture of the very next car, 609. This is a William Henry Jackson photograph close-up. So that's what it's, it's going to look like. The other side and the other end are unrestored. Part of the reason is we want it to be an interpretive display. We're not going to run this, this car in a train. But it, it kind of tells the history. It was made into a, a crew car for a while. There's windows in the other side. But the real reason, or the most important reason, I think, was the original DSP and PRR is still readable on the other side. And we didn't want to lose that by, by painting over it. Uh, Scott Francis, he's out uh, just this side of St. Louis. He's a body and fender guy, par excellence. And he has taken on re helping us to re rebuild a, a brand new South Park Zephyr. It's a Model T that, uh, are you familiar with this or maybe not, but real quick. When the railroad uh, left town in April 1937, the track lay dormant the rest of that year, except for some equipment moves. And in 1938, they started pulling up the tracks at Fremont Pass, working their way back down to 10 Mile, Frisco, Breckenridge, Boreas Pass, down to Como, and over to Kenosha Pass and down the Platte Valley, uh, down to South Platte that year, and eventually all the way to Denver. But in the spring of 38, three local residents in Como uh, converted a Model T to run on the three-foot gauge track, and they went all over the place. And there's a lot of photographs of this. Uh, they went up over Boreas Pass and down through Breckenridge. There's a, a picture today we have of them at a gas station in Breckenridge. And they went through Frisco, and up. we know they went as far as Kokomo. Uh, we have a photograph of this thing in front of the depot at Kokomo, and they tried to go to the top of Fremont Pass. The track was still there, but it had been abandoned, and the Climax mine was already filling in the valley with dirt. And today, there's a huge amount of dirt. The town of Robinson is completely buried, and it almost reaches down to Kokomo. Uh, but they had a lot of fun with it, and they went down to Garrow and up to Alma and Fairplay, and even over Kenosha and down the Platte Valley for a while. Anyway... We don't know what happened to the original one. It's been lost to time, but we're recreating it, and hopefully pretty soon we'll be giving rides on the South Park Zephyr. You may notice this little chalk mark. It's V1 half, and the guys that built this thing, it was kind of a joke. Ford had just come out with a V8, and it's had a straight flat four, of course, so it's one half of a V. A little, little private humor there. But it's it's on the recreation as well. So there's the original in Como. And here they are up in Boreas Pass. I think this was taken at Farnham. There's one picture, and if you're familiar with Model Ts, you know their brakes were awful. And I think they were going downhill, and they couldn't stop it in time, and they ended up on top of a snowbank, almost flipping it over. Luckily, it didn't flip over. Nobody got hurt, but I'm sure they had a lot of fun with this. And Caboose 1008, uh, you guys are probably familiar with this story. Uh, Richard Farmer out in Northridge, California, and his brother Bob, who actually lives in Phoenix, found this in, uh, I think it was Pasadena. It was somewhere in the area, Northridge. Uh, a, a property went up for sale. A realtor friend of Richard's called him and said, there's this old wooden caboose in the backyard. Can you find a home for it or tell me what it is or it's got to go? And he thought it would probably be an old SP caboose or something. And he saw that it was CNS 1008, which everybody thought had long since disappeared from the scene. Well, it disappeared from the local scene, but not off the face of the earth. And he and his brother are doing literally a Smithsonian level operational restoration on this car. 
here's the original frame and they you can see the new pieces they were hoping originally to be able to use it but they realized that it's just a little too far gone too soft so they disassembled it photographed it measured it they built a new frame which i'll show you in the next slide and uh, he called me one day and, and said well my wife says i got to get this thing out of the backyard do you want it so we went out and got a u-haul truck and brought it back and now it's a, an artifact on display in the roundhouse but look at this and then look at the frame that they built and this gives you an appreciation for the level of detail and, and the quality work that they're doing this is going to be an amazing car when they're done uh dnrg stock car 5743 we've accepted donations for this and um, it's on hold right now we have two uh, old dnrg stock cars and it's almost a tough choice to figure out which one we want to restore and now there's even talk we might just make a flat car out of it, but I hope we, we continue and, and make a stock car restoration out of it. But at the moment, that's on the back burner. So the Como water tank is the big project we're working on now. And this is another January 1929, close up of a bigger picture. Uh, this is the one we're restoring right behind the roundhouse. There was another tank down here at the south end of the yard where that's on private property. We're not doing anything with that. And over here is the coal dock. Uh, the Park Gulch Trestle. That's on our radar, but this is on hold right now because uh, earlier this year, I started the process of asking permission to build over to the old King Y. Now, the, the Doc and Kathy Brannigan on the roundhouse and the locomotive own the land. Como's up here. And they own the land to about 10 feet this side of the trestle. But all of this up to the King Y uh, is on what they call the Klein Ranch property. Park County bought it with federal money because it's federal money. A lot of organizations have their, their finger in this pie. And uh, we lost round one. I uh, went to the uh, Division of Wildlife. And they turned us down saying it would mess around with the uh, elk migration routes. <sighs> There might be kids watching. I got to watch my language here. Anyway, we're going to pursue this. And I'm hoping, like organizations like the Rocky Mountain Railroad Club, in the future to get letters of support. And we'll go to the Board of County Commissioners in uh, Park County and hopefully convince them. And I'll show you in a minute why it doesn't make any sense about the elk migration. All right, this is a 1920s shot actually 30s excuse me and it shows bay seven eight and nine and originally there were 19 bays well originally there were six in the stone roundhouse and in two phases in the 80s and early 90s they added 13 more wooden stalls these were disassembled in 1923 in fact we have the original afe copies that authorized that except for seven eight and nine which they kept and those burned down in 1935 and were never rebuilt but we're hoping to rebuild seven, eight, and nine. And earlier you saw the pits in seven and eight. Um, some folks want to rebuild all of them. I don't know if we'll ever get that far. That would be a huge project. And we don't need that much space, but we can sure use seven, eight, and nine. An aerial shot. This was actually a few years ago. The water tank hasn't started yet, but that's where it's going. And the Gunnison, Maine actually comes down to right at the bottom of this picture now. And the north end goes up to almost to those trees. And the Denver, Maine, we just have a few lengths of rail wrapped around the hotel, but it went down here, across the trestle that's now long gone and up the other side. And it's off this picture, but the King Y would be over here. So here's a better representation of what we're looking at. Um, the old Gunnison, Maine, and the Leadville, Maine. So right now the track ends about here. There's that Aspen Grove. And if that ranch ever sells, the new owner says we can build more track, we'll go from there up to where it crosses the road. But we're not going to cross any roads. But what we're hoping to do, here's the Denver, Maine. We, we rebuild the trestle. And again, we own to about right there. But we hope to build another half a mile of track or so up to the King Y. This is all part of the Klein Ranch. Um, and that went down to the King Coal Mine and the Denver Main goes that way. But we could build, if they give us permission, out to the King Y, 
with enough of the tails of the Y to turn a short train, or at least the engine, but it's probably a two, three car train. And that would give us about a one mile run with the ability to turn the engine at both ends on the Y and on the turntable. And that's about as far as we plan to go. And we really can't go any further without crossing a road. And I'm sure you can all imagine why we don't want to do that. Here's the Klein Ranch. Here's Como. And all we want to do is scratch the bottom of the Klein Ranch, which is between Como and 285, with its never ending line of traffic these days. There might be some elk go goofing around up here, but they are not crossing down here. Okay, the big day of the year, Boreas Pass Railroad Day, which is always the third Saturday in August. Keep that in mind, third Saturday in August. That's our big open house. Speeder rides. Uh, the society owns this speeder. This is a 1952 Fairmont speeder that was originally made brand new for the Tacoma power plant on the Durango and Silverton. Kids love to push the engine around. Even if there's nothing on the turntable, they love to push the turntable. Hand car rides, that's a big hit. Everybody loves that. And it gives them an appreciation. This particular piece of track is the one we usually use. It's a very slight downhill to the south. When we come around back to the north, they're huffing and puffing. And I say, you think this is hard? Can you imagine going up Boreas Pass on this thing? And the Roundhouse concert, this is the highlight of the day. I tell folks, if you're not even interested in Como Railroad history, come for the concert. Uh, Chuck and Kathy Brannigan, again, founded the Denver Brass years ago when they were tuba players, and they, they manage it today. And they bring them up. There's usually 14 or 15, and they're accompanied by the Celtic Colorado bagpipers and drums. And it is incredible. It's hauntingly beautiful is how I describe it. I tell people, bring tissues. You get misty-eyed. They play period music, John Philip Sousa, Amazing Grace, things like that. Goes for about 90 minutes, and, and it's, I would pay $100 for a seat at this thing, and it's free. Third Saturday in August at 2.30. Hmm, with the space out there. So hopefully we'll see this again next year. Could be a historic photograph. And this is our unofficial motto, having fun getting stuff done. And there are the uh, website addresses for both organizations. Uh, feel free to jump on there and look around, see what we're all about. Anybody wants to join, there's, there's ways to do it or on there. Um, and that pretty much is the end of tonight's program. I'll take questions now if you have any. Thank you. Thank you. Are you running a chat room over there? Is that how it works? Yeah. Well, he's working on that. Any questions from the live audience? Yes, Bob? Sir. Oh, hi. When uh, they finish that caboose 1008, do you think you'll be able to keep it there for a period of time when the farmer brothers finish that uh, restoration on the caboose? Yeah, nothing firm on that yet. He promised me it's coming back. I don't know if it's a visit or permanently. I remember he said, if it comes to Como, and I talked to Doc and Kathy Brannigan, and we've offered them garage space in the roundhouse. Of course, you wouldn't want to leave that thing outside with all the work they're putting into it. And he said, oh, I would want it available uh, to do road trips, Georgetown Loop or Colorado Railroad Museum or whatever. And we said, sure, absolutely. So I don't know what the final disposition will be, but I'm pretty darn sure you will see it again in Como, even if it's just a visit. Any other questions? And where?
where does the uh, one half V, where is it going to live? In the roundhouse. Oh, okay. In fact, I'm glad you brought that up. Here's another solicitation. We're not sure what the final cost is going to be, but if anybody wants to be a part owner or a partner, we welcome that. Uh, Norm Acker started that. He's going to put some money into it, and I will too, personally. Uh, but if anybody's interested in a piece of the action, be a part owner of the South Park Zephyr, contact me. We'll talk. Any other questions here in the house? Roger. I'm looking at the picture you have up there, and there are two structures on the platform of the hotel. What are those? You haven't been to Como in the wintertime. They're windbreaks. The depot had it too, but since nobody goes in in the winter, we haven't reconstructed that. But the winter winds up there are hurricane force. David Tompkins, who owns a hotel, which is a brick building, has told me he felt that building move in the winter winds. Anyone else? I, uh, let's see, I was, had a comment about that uh, <clears throat> restored gondola that used to be up above Central City. Uh, I think one of the stories I heard, and maybe Mr. Klinger knows this, but that, that, gate that was cut in the side of it i was told that uh i guess the agreement was when uh that concessionaire ran it several years ago they were told specifically not to cut any holes in the side but i guess that happened anyway <laughs> did you ever hear that story no i'm glad that you guys got it put back together well if we were going to haul passengers in it it would be kind of awkward without a gate but we're not playing that game but at least you can get them in from the end or something now, I think, yeah. right? It's yeah. not wheelchair accessible, but it's authentic. Yeah, yeah that's right. And uh, you were saying that there's going to be the four big plastic or some sort of artificial tanks inside the other yeah. tank that that way it doesn't drip all winter and rot itself. It'll yeah. look the part. You, you, you won't see them. And uh, originally there was a big probably 30 foot ladder on the outside of all those tanks. And we're not going to recreate that for obvious reasons. So since it's dry, we have the advantage inside the frost box. There'll be a ladder to a trap door in the floor. Since it's always dry, it's not a factor. And we'll lock the door at the bottom of the frost box and it'll be safe. Keep, keep the browsers out. Yes. So, And uh, this sort of points up the fact that he mentioned that we they did a lot of the restoration with grant money from the railroad club's uh, historic foundation uh, for people that may not be aware, we have this as an ongoing project that uh, usually every year we award a few small grants for restoration. And if you have an organization that uh, is looking for a little help uh, you know, some, some projects are just too small to be on the radar of a lot of uh, granting organizations. And we like this kind of follow-up uh, for the organizations that have taken some grant money from us, and we like to see how things turn out. So we also are encouraging the, the people that have had some grants from the Rocky Club and the Rocky Mountain Railroad Historical Foundation in the past, we like to see your finished product. So hint, hint, this was a really good finished product show. So, yes, sir. Hold that thought. It's interesting to note that all four of the Klondike mine engines still exist. You guys have one, the Klondike Quate. There are three in the Railroad Museum in uh, Boston oh, City. Boston, yeah. And I went up there several years ago, and they said, well, we don't have a train interpreter for you, so we can't show them to you. I said, I'm a licensed engineer. Who they, you know, I can speak train. That did, if you're talking to Canadians, and I lived there for years in Ottawa, no but they are there and they're inside. So they are all intact, which is amazing for a small mining railroad. Uh, three of them are in Dawson city in a museum. Oh, it's in the Yukon territory. Sergeant Preston, you know, Sergeant Preston, Yukon King, Wonder Horse, Rex. Uh, I, he wasn't in town when we were there, but it is interesting that that's actually there. Hey, one question, Bob. 
where did you find the water tank uh, spout? Remember the water tank Somewhere spout? You on said the property. It's been moved around so many times, but it was in Como. Really? Yeah. Small world. <laughs> the other day, our Covenant Living made a trip to uh, Silver Plume to ride the train up to, to Georgetown, ride the train to Silver Plume and back. Nice, fun trip and stuff. Both directions go to Idaho Springs. I was trying to find that number 60 locomotive that's in Idaho Springs. Is that still there or not? I thought it was. Uh, oh, it is. It's not where it's been for years? I, I think uh, I think the Silver Plume guys are working on a cosmetic restoration. Is that right, Wally? Come on up here, Wally, because, you know, the folks at home want to see your smiling face, by golly. Ladies and gentlemen, Wally Wirt. Well, the, yes, the engine's there. It's over by City Hall, on a, and it sits on a piece of the original right-of-way. The car is up in uh, Silver Plume in the Colorado Historical or History Colorado's car barn, whatever they call it up there, and it's undergoing restoration. When they opened that car up, they found it was in far worse condition than they thought. There was water down the walls. It's, just, it's really a basket case. The same guys are restoring the, the CNS caboose that sat in... Uh, silver plume on a little piece of track by the firehouse but yeah the engine's still there it's very hard to see but it's at the it'd be the west end of the big parking lot by city hall and it's there and they're going to put the coach back with it i've been told that when they get that done they're going to repaint the engine and they're going to put a some kind of a cover over it so yeah it, yeah what uh, brian and this discussion was about was the uh engine and car that have been on display in Idaho Springs. Uh, like Wally said, Caboose 1006 that sat outside at Silver Plume for years is in that restoration facility in Silver Plume getting worked on and as is the coach. And uh, I think Phil Johnson told me that once that coach is fixed up, they might let them run it up and down for a couple of years before it has to go back to Idaho Springs. We would, we would hope so, you know, once you've got a piece of track to run it on. So it's a little off the track of your Como story, but it's all in the family, right? Yep. Uh, any, any questions from the internet, Nathan? Can you tell? Usually we have Will Deal chiming in, but he's probably on the road tonight. So. Any other comments uh, related to this show? Thanks for taking Thanks the for time, Bob. Me. God, it was a really good show. You know, we'll have to have you back uh, next year, maybe the year after. Next year, they could have thousands more things done so yeah maybe we should do this again next year be my pleasure yeah all right well uh thanks for coming uh next month's program will be uh dennis livesey showing us some more of his fabulous images this will be uh, a long distance show via the internet from new york city where he lives but uh dennis has some really fabulous stuff to show us and he did a program for us i don't know a year year and a half ago so we're glad to have him back and then in December, we will probably uh, get together here, possibly with a video program from Keith, uh, uh, who's our treasurer, who's not here tonight because he's on the road back from another show and, and maybe uh, cookies and soda like we sometimes do. We've kind of missed that in past years. I know it's, it's the, the peak of entertaining, but, uh, you know, we, we kind of miss that during those dark COVID days. So any other comments? I guess I can be quiet now. All right. <laughs> okay, Nathan, I think you could cut this off before I talk about chairs. So <laughs> are we still out to the world? Oh, you forgot to record. The joys of technology, you know. What I was going to say is if, if somebody would pull the, the chair rack out of the closet, if everybody would just hang your chair back on the rack, that would be great. Our deal with the church is they set up the chairs if we'll take them down. So uh, thank you for coming.